Um, yeah, thank you. Um, kia ora. My name's uh, Adam Hyde. I, um, I live in Berlin. I'm from uh, New Zealand. Um, I um, am the founder of Floss Manuals, which is an uh, organization of a community of about 4,000 people that collaborate online to produce books about how to use free software. And uh, this is about five years old now. We have about, um, well, we have over 500 books being worked on and about 120, 130 which are available online. Everything's for free. You can get it online as a web page, an EPUB. Uh, you can get the books as also PDF, and you can buy the books as well. And the books are available um, in over 15 languages. Not all of them, but 15 languages we have books um, written in. Um, the main languages are Finnish, English, and French. Um, so Floss Manuals started with a specific need, which was to solve uh, the problem of the lack of free documentation about free software. And in order to do this, we actually had to um, invent processes to develop this content. And one of the things that we found we, uh, ourselves doing was building a tool which is turned into a book production platform. This tool was originally called Bookie, and it's now called Booktype, and um, I'm one of the co-founders of Booktype. And it's now being developed by Sourcefabric, which is a Berlin-based open source development company. And it's an open source software that anybody can use. So I'll talk about these two projects a little bit. And also another methodology that Floss Manuals uh, developed is one called Book Sprints, which is a very intensive collaborate, a collaborative process of developing a book online um, with five to 10 people in, um, in a room but using an online platform, and um, developing a book in two to five days. So that's from zero, from nothing, to a, a published book in five days. So it's a very intensive, very rich collaborative process. So it's a little bit about my background, and I'll introduce these concepts as I talk about um, where the publishing industry is now and what the opportunities are for people like us, because I think at the moment, the publishing industry is sort of innovating and changing in a great, a great deal, but actually the innovations that are most interesting and exciting, and which I think will represent um, a very, very rich and interesting future for publishing, are things that the publishing industry are unable to do, but people like us, um, people who are used to working and collaborating online, we are the great innovators in this sector. So, I'll, um, I'll roll forward. So, just to talk a little, a little bit about how you might be able to see the publishing industry. It's just a schema to help us think about where innovation takes place. So, they're essentially uh, post-Gutenberg and pre-Tim Berners-Lee, you can essentially break down the traditional publishing process into four parts. This is a very bird's eye view of publishing. So it starts with production, which is, you know, single author, sometimes a couple of authors, but generally an author, uh, an editorial process, a proofing process, uh, tightly managed um, by the publisher, um, often with the editor taking the lead role, um, a designer, everybody involved in producing a book for fiction and non-fiction works. And this is um, the production cycle. It's, very, it's not really a cycle so much as a linear process, um, which has uh, been the foundation of the publishing industry ever since it evolved after Gutenberg. So um, that's one part of it. The other part is the object itself. We know this in the traditional book publishing industry. They've been producing books, interestingly enough. Um, the paper codex, which is, you know, pages bound together in, in two covers. We all know this object. Um, third part is the market, right? Which is the distribution of this artifact to retail and the resale of these artifacts to the reader. And then the last part of a traditional um, publishing model is the bookshelf, which is uh, effectively the archive. So the reader has this book. It has a, a usefulness for this reader. Uh, at that moment. After that, it may be useful as a reference device or a, you know, a great piece of art, um, such as literature, may be revisited and, and maintains value over time. But it also might be something which is a nostalgic artifact. But generally speaking, it goes into an archive, which is uh, a bookshelf, right? You buy the book and you put it onto the bookshelf. So these are kind of the four segments, the four parts of the traditional book 
publishing process model. This is one way of looking at it. What's happening right now is that the publishing industry is going through a lot of change. And if you go to any publishing conferences, you'll find um, various degrees of, um, of optimism and fear. Um, it depends also where you are. In, um, in Deutschland, there's a lot of um, fear about what the changes are going on um, and trying to grapple with you know, how this works. And um, places which, like the uh, United States of America, the Tools of Change Conference, there's a lot of optimism, optimism um, but also a lot of fear. And, uh, but the, the major changes that are taking place are essentially taking place in these middle two segments. So we all know that there's been a lot of innovation going on in online sales. Um, this actually even happened before the popularity of the electronic book. So Amazon, of course, and other online retail sellers were getting online and selling books. This was a major innovation in the book publishing industry. So this is essentially a process of replication, right? Substitution. You just There's retail sales through shops, but also um, replicating that online in online, online sales. Um, last year was kind of many considered to be the great year of the ebook. And the ebook appeared on the scene um, when well, it's been around for a long time. But Amazon last year said, well, um, actually, everybody, been, there was a lot of discussion. Is this really going to be the way it is? Amazon last year said, well, in some titles, ebooks, electronic books, are outselling um, in some titles 105 ebooks to every paper book being sold. And suddenly the industry woke up and said, wow, OK. This is something that we really now have to consider. And of course, since then, there's been a lot of interesting developments. Um, there's a lot of, there's um, Apple uh, released uh, the iBook author, and there's these kind of things. Production softwares are starting to appear. And devices are starting to become, there's a battle for devices. And of course, the major players largely being Apple and Amazon, once again. So the innovation in these areas is happening all around this central part, right? It's the object. The electronic book has arrived, and publishers are, are dealing with this. And the market has changed in terms of online sales and distribution, right? So you're distributing now to devices, and there's another market, the device market. But by and large, the first and the last segments, parts, are left untouched. There's, there's very little innovation going on in this area. And it's got, there's a lot of reasons why it's like this. Um, Largely, publishers are invested with staff overheads, workflows, um, tools even, which prevent them from being able to innovate in important areas like production. It's very hard even for a lot of publishers to transfer from one fo file format to another file format, for example. And one of the, the um, most common document formats uh, that publishers use is um, Word documents and uh, collaboration through email by sending Word documents around. Very inefficient, horrible, and linear, necessarily linear process. Um, and on the other side, you still have the bookshelf, except for it's also your device now, or your Kindle store where you keep everything uh, loaded if you can't get it onto your space available on your Kindle, for example. So the archive still exists. This is a very important part, right? The book goes into the archive you access it when required. Now, um, what's interesting about this is that the most interesting innovations to take place, in my opinion, happen all outside of these two areas. So um, when it comes to production, there's because of tools that are starting to come available, which are online tools for producing books, it opens up book production to people like us. And it opens up social production and collaborative production processes. And this is something that largely um, can, is the, the best context for it is also uh, within free culture, free license context, right? Because collaboration is, is most easily facilitated in an environment where you lower the threshold to participation as much as possible. And free licenses enable this. And all rights reserved copyright, license, copyright licenses do not enable this. It's not a good environment for rich collaboration, intensive collaboration. Oh, in this sector, you can think about 
you can replace the linear production process, which is common to the, the publishing industry, by a more cyclical um, collaborative process. So this is a process where you can have an online environment, which has been activated by these online book production tools, where people may at one point be, do a little bit of writing, and may at another point proof or edit somebody else's work, and may at another point give feedback to a designer. But it's an open, um, it's an open and transparent process. It's a process of online collaboration as we know, right? You can see what's going on. Everything is transparent to you. You can participate and put your energy in where you feel that there's the most need or where you have the most motivation to participate. So of course, this is very generic. I'm speaking very generally. There are, of course, different models for collaboration in this environment too. You know, you can still use these same online book production tools and just author a book by yourself, but you can also put yourself at another part of the spectrum, which is an open collaborative environment or anywhere along that spectrum. So you can keep the door as open as closed as you want, but the point, important point is, is that you have this control. It's not a tightly controlled environment, um, uh, environment managed by a publisher, but it's managed by the participants. Right? It's social production. It's also a fun process. It's a process of engaging with other people that have like interests and building something together. All right? And this is something that the, the publishing industry, by and large, doesn't understand, doesn't know how to get involved with. But it's something that is, is very much becoming second nature of people who already produce content on the net. And people within the free culture environment have a special advantage in this area. So. Um, just to look at a couple of examples of some very interesting things that are happening in this, in this first phase, the production phase. There are a lot of books, and when I, when I talk about books here, these online production environments enable you to produce paper books and electronic books, right? But they also allow you to also produce web pages with the same content. So the, the book itself is becoming very blurred. You know, what is a book? It's no longer this codex. You can't even talk about a digital codex. You're just talking about book-like content. And I'm not going to talk about the nature of the book in too much detail here, apart from the fact that the book still seems to have significant cultural hold, and we still seem to need them, at least in some uh, areas. So these are, uh, this is an example of a, um, uh, uh, books that have been produced uh, recently collaboratively. It's an organization called Siavula. They, uh, from South Africa, operate in Cape Town. And um, they produce um, open source, so to speak, um, textbooks for South African schools. And these books are produced collaboratively. So the way Sia Buller works is that they get a whole lot of teachers together voluntarily. These teachers take the time to work over a weekend, or actually several weekends. And they, um, they do an audit of the curriculum, the South African government's curriculum um, description. They work out a table of contents from that, and then uh, they review it as a group, they work out um, parts to each of those chapters, and then they sit down together in groups, and they take on specific chapters and collaboratively write these chapters together. So this is all done voluntary, and these books um, are done under, a, under free licenses, and all the production for them is done online. So these um, two books here, for example, Everything Maths and Everything Science, produced by Siavula, the South African government um, printed two and a half million paper copies of these, which is a very successful illustration of collaborative book production on a level where the government obviously felt that the quality was high enough to bring it to schools. And this worked out also, of course, cheaper for the government because there is no cost for each of those units. They don't have to buy them from a publisher that puts on a, on a market markup. They work out how much they want to pay Siavula for helping them along this road, and then they um, pay for the actual direct printing of the, of the content. There's one example. And these are available online also, and Siavula are now going through the next iteration, which is writing textbooks for grade four, five, and six in areas of natural science and things like this. Um, another really interesting um, process of online collaboration is book sprints, which I mentioned before. So book sprints are a facilitated process. You bring together five to 10 people, although more have been involved in these things, and you collaboratively produce a book together. 
and you do it in, in between two and five days. And this is using online production environments, um, it, you know, an online platform for writing, but most of the work is done in real space. So a facilitator brings everyone to a room. It's generally an organization has an idea of a book that they want to write. And there's no pre-production done. And it's important to understand this because the real richness, um, the definition of the book, the scope of the book is decided by the people that are participating in the book's production. Right? So there's no, not somebody sitting back and saying, this is all the things that you have to cover, and then everyone working out who has to write the book, whether they can actually write that and what they meant by all of this table of contents um, uh, structure. But they actually take the topic of the book and together construct the table of contents in the first morning of the book sprint, and then proceed to write it and, and collaborate in this very intensive, open cyclical manner that I was talking about. Everyone's in the same room. They talk to each other about various issues. And it actually turns out to be an incredibly rich, discursive process, as well as a learning environment for all of those involved. So even if you have five to 10 experts in the same room, you're talking with each other to get an understanding of how to explain something in the book. You're learning a great deal about the subject that you are an expert in. And these processes often always, or as much as possible, have a member of the audience involved in the sprint as well, so that you're actually writing um, the book for a target audience that's sitting there in front of you, so you can actually talk to them and say, does this make sense? You know, there's one thing to advocate an audience position, there's another one to have a member of, a representative member of that target audience telling you they do or don't understand it and looking at you, you in the eye. You take it much more seriously. So book sprints um, can also happen online, there was, um, and they produce high quality works. So um, there was one particular book sprint which was done uh, a couple of years ago, um, and it was a two-day book sprint about the command line. It's a very technical subject. And um, it was written in two days. Um, it's about 340 pages. It's all free content. It's very high quality. And Benjamin Marco Hill, who may be known to some of you, who's a board member of the Free Software Foundation and also on the advisory board for um, the uh, Wikimedia uh, Foundation that manages Wikipedia, um, and he's authored books on this topic, said this was the best book on its topic. And it was written in two days. And it's material that can be translated because it's free. It's in a framework which enables you to fork it, to clone it, to take parts from it, to cr create your own works. So the nice thing about a book sprint is that not only does it create this, these fabulous works, but it also creates an energy and a momentum within a group that can carry that work forward, right? So you're creating a team with a book sprint as well as generating an energy to take the book forward and to have people involved in its maintenance and ongoing production, as well as making it available for anyone to take to do with what they want. Um, and another example is Beta House, which is um, probably known to a lot of people here, is a co-working space in Berlin. And they got together, and because co-working is a very rich and intensive collaborative um, environment, it's what it's trying to generate and achieve. It's not just a place where you go and put your laptop. Um, the uh, Beta House um, had a book sprint to facilitate the production of a book about what is co-working, because they wanted to evangelize about the model that Beta House was exploring. And so they invited a lot of people who had um, experience in this area from within Beta House to write on this topic together and produce this book, which is available from Beta House itself, or you can buy it online. So I use this also just to show you that it's not all technical subjects. Um, it, the most work that's happening in this area of book sprints is generally happening in very um, definite subject areas. There's very little exploration in fiction so far, but the results so far, and it's a very young process, it's about three years old, um, is, are very exciting and, and uh, very worthwhile. Okay, so the other part of it, of this, um, where the innovation is taking place and where the most exciting things are taking place, which the publishing industry itself is really unable to reap the benefits of, is the transition of books from being static artifacts, the thing you put on your bookshelf, to being living, growing items, right? We come to understand the book as being a static thing, right? It's finite and fixed. A really good online example, and I can, hand, I can give anyone the URLs for these things later, is um, a really nice 
visualization if you want to go online and search for Ben Fry, Origin of Species. Um, we all think of the origin of species, Darwin's um, work, as being this, this static theory, right? You know, it just is the or origin of, of um, species. But actually, um, this visualization by Ben Fry shows that there were six editions, and the thesis changed greatly over that period, right? During the course of Darwin's life, the book was living. He was changing it all the time. He removed enormous sections and put other sections in and changed almost, well, as you can see, every different color here represents a different edition. He changed every part of the book. So the thesis was living. So books and, and re, being republished, so books have had uh, the ability to be alive, um, but, we, but we kind of killed it off. The publishing industry has kind of killed it off. We, re, we rely on this static artifact, the authoritative version, the version produced by the author. And it's a very, um, it's a very um, inefficient, if you like, way to talk about or to deal with this amazing content. Why can't we take this content and do something with it? Why can't we take a maths book? And there's plenty of maths books being written every year. Why can't we take one of them and recontextualize it to better suit the needs of our students, for example? That might mean just simple translation, um, which is a type of reuse and probably the most popular. Why can't we recontextualize it, use examples which are better suited for our students, for our students' needs, for their context? So there's a lot to be gained by being able to reuse content and think about books as living and growing entities and things that can go off in many different directions. And the publishing industry doesn't really know how to deal with this because in order to work with this, you actually have to do it within the rubric of um, free culture, right? Of free licenses. If you're going to try and manage a real rich environment where books can live and grow and become something new and, and be improved and develop or be recontextualized, it's very, very difficult to do this within an all rights reserved environment. It's, it's more or less impossible. Um, whereas free licenses enable you to take this content and to keep developing it. One interesting thing on this, in this area, however, is that this is probably the, one of the areas within the, um, uh, within the publishing world where we've seen um, not that much going on. Uh, even though we have had, been living with digital free culture for quite some time now. And I believe there's two things that are kind of stopping this. One is that there have until recently been the lack of tools available to reuse content. But the other one is that people don't feel that they can change books. You know, a book is produced, and um, I've been involved in working with free books for a long time. I often get asked by people, is it all right if we do this with it? And of course, you know, the whole point is you don't have to ask permission, right? Licenses afford you that. So you can just take the content and do whatever you want. But there still seems to be this cultural issue where people feel that even though it's explicit, that they lack the mandate to change books. And one of the things that I think that we have to do, which the publishing industry can't do, to take real advantage of this kind of thing, is that we should start ourselves improving books. We should grab a book and improve it to start gaining this mandate for ourselves. I think it's incredibly important. Um, but there is another way to think about, um, about reuse as well, which is possibly a little bit more radical in some ways. And it's closely akin to what is known in, um, in the software development circles as forking, right? So a fork of a software is when you have one version of a so software, and for whatever reason, so a, a group of people take it off an entirely different direction, right? Not improving it or translating it or recontextualizing it, but disagreeing with it, even. Disagreeing with the paradigm or the principles or the thesis. And there have been some experiments in this area, um, also in Berlin, Transmediala, the Berlin Arts Festival, um, hosted an event called Collaborative Futures, which brought five people together to write a book about collaborative futures. Um, notably, it, it, um, Mike Linksflayer, the vice president of Creative Commons, was a participant, uh, several professors and artists also. And this group got together for five days and wrote this book, Collaborative Futures. There was nothing but the title, Collaborative Futures. And they put their trust in the process, the book sprint process, to develop a work. But this was highly conceptual, right? So, you know, imagine walking into a room, 
you've got a, a festival backing you to do this thing. They all come with their reputations on the line and commit to the process of working with five people they've never met to develop a book in five days. It's quite a, a spooky idea. Um, but they, they persisted. They got to the end of the week, and they produced a book that they're very happy with. But not only that, the experience itself is something that um, they're talking about to this day has been this very rich, um, rewarding, discursive process. So the process was rewarding not just in the artifact to these people, but actually in the, the process itself was something that they gained immense value from, strong team building and learning environment. But this book, some months later, was um, forked. Some of the original members got another group together at iBeam in New York. It's an arts organization in New York. And they, um, they got three or four other people who had not been involved in the original book, and they essentially rewrote it. So they did another book sprint, and they, first of all, battled with the theses that were explicit in the book and sort of disagreed with it. And then they stopped it reacting to this, and then they took ownership of the book and started making it their own, started making the narrative their own. And, there, and the, so there's now two versions of this book, Collaborative Futures Squared, Collaborative Futures 2, and Collaborative Futures, and the thesis is represented are quite different from each other. There's quite a lot of disagreement um, within the book. There's even dis disagreement between the books and within the book itself. Um, and what you can hear in this process is that you can hear the discourse of active, engaged, lively minds that are feeding on a topic area, uh, which is a very interesting uh, idea. Very different from thinking about the authoritative voice um, and the, you know, the, the all-knowing author. So there are even, I, I would say, very interesting, potentially, you don't, no one ever wants to say new, <laughs> but there are areas which are interesting to explore um, which are narrative forms that, could, that can come out of, this pro out of these processes. Okay, so um, this is all great, right? So um, the publishing industry largely can't access a lot of this innovation. They're stuck in their own model. They largely uh, need to sell books in order to get revenues. They have investments in staff and workflows and, and tools um, they even have to rely on the reputation of authors to get market value. They try and sell books. They're dealing with the difficult case that e-books are driving the prices down, uh, you know, aided by uh, Amazon and various strategies within the uh, resale channels. Um, they're trying to struggle to find an area to, to keep these, this model intact by doing, you know, dealing with these new digital artifacts. Um, but the, we know that Stage three is being severely disrupted at the moment. So the question is, let's say that you have all this collaboratively produced material and it's all available under free licenses. So how do you make any money from this? How is it possibly sustainable? And you can think publishers looking at this going, okay, so I'm already having trouble trying to reestablish my market here, prices are going down, um, so now I'm gonna make the content free, are you, are you crazy? Um, and the point is, is that there, is, there are economics at work here, and there are economics which are entirely consistent with collaborative production, and there are economics which are also entirely consistent with free culture. And in fact, free culture and these kind of economics work beautifully together. And what it relies on is not resale of the artifact, although that can still persist in the systems. Also, by the way, it's still possible to sell um, free content. But, it, but the important addition to this economic engine is services, right? So the idea in, in its first instance is to put the revenue generation at the beginning and not at, the, not at stage three, which is effectively the end when the reader accesses the content. So in real, what this means is generating revenue um, to produce a book before the book is produced. And if you can do that, of course, you have um, lowered your risk, everybody gets paid, and you have the real opportunity to then really let that content go um, as far as possible. And the further it goes, because you don't have to get any more financial return from it, the further it goes, the better it works for you because it enhances your reputation that you produce this artifact, which in turn helps you generate money for the next one, right? 
So as an example, there's some of this stuff happening already. We know Kickstarter, right? This is a model which is known to us where people pledge towards the production of a work. And there are significant amounts of money being spent in this area, being pledged in this area. You can see here the most funded um, from yesterday uh, on Kickstarter, books, um, uh, $140,000 US dollars um, for one book. Um, this one is my, um, my favorite. This is um, Rigetzi's Big Book of Fabricated Folk Tales from Finland, which you wouldn't think there would be a great audience for, right? If somebody's just going to make up some folk tales, <laughs> the um, folk tales are meant to, in some ways, you know, you think they come from a tradition, they're just going to make them up. Finland is a very small country, very small language base. $64,000 generated for that specific book. Um, some other good examples is the brother of Terence McKenna did a very nice, um, you know, and to go against the, you know, there is a certain production value and a kind of tone that works good in these environments. If you get the time, you should look at the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. It's the brother of Terence McKenna, is a kind of a um, poet from the psychedelic 60s era, if you don't know him. Um, quite well known and quite followed by people who follow that genre. And, um, and Terence McKenna's brother did like a one shot, I just want to tell the story about my brother, and um, generated uh, $85,000 before he produced a word of the book. So these mechanisms are starting to come in place, right? It's really possible to start looking at the crowd crowdfunding models, and there, there are a lot of uh, platforms that are coming along online that are looking specifically at raising funds for book production, so, um, which is your traditional crowdfunding model. But there's also business arguments here as well. If you look at, um, there's one organization I was involved in doing a book sprint with, a small um, service, internet service provider called Greenhost. They put the money up front, raised the money to do a book sprint to bring their staff to Berlin to write a book about basic internet security. They wrote this book in three days. It's a very good book. Um, they, and it was not a marketing book. It was produced by Greenhouse, but it's gener generally applicable. I think Greenhouse mentioned themselves once or twice in the introduction, which is a very important strategy, I believe, um, to gain trust. So this book was then um, printed and they released it in a, at an event in Amsterdam, the International um, Press Freedom event, and um, it was an enormous success. And they could go around saying, we wrote this book two days ago, here it is, you can have it. It's also available online for free. And these kind of artifacts in that context are extremely important. Nobody puts together very good, readable, comprehensive material in that area, right? And these guys did it for this event, did it in three days and turned up with the book and the press went kind of crazy about it. And the small ISP, not only did they have a very good um, team building um, process through this, it was part, partly the reason why they did it, um, not only were they able to help something that they believed in, which is press freedom, but they also got a tremendous amount of press attention from this internationally and also within the Netherlands. So this is the Volkskrant, which is one of the largest newspapers in the Netherlands. And this provided, and there was a lot of coverage like this, pointing at Greenhouse and saying, wow, this is amazing. This is, this is goodwill and PR attention that a small organization like that would not otherwise be able to reach. So there are really also arguments, uh, arguments that businesses can understand to pay for the production of books. It can also be not just on the PR level, but it can be, for example, to assist in the documentation of internal processes, or it can be to generate knowledge which they, they don't know, they can't otherwise access, there's no available resources for something in particular, or they need to get their teams together to write specific things, or whatever. Um, and you can also imagine instances of communities going to businesses and saying, help us with this to generate, and we want to write this book, um, and that generating goodwill within the community, right? Typical kind of community sponsorship roles. Um, yeah, so um, I think I'll end it there because um, it would be great to have some discussion if anybody has any questions. Um, all of this material has been put together um, uh, on a book called um, A Web Page is a Book, which is available um, on this URL. Um, if you go there, you'll see uh, an edit interface like this. And I would really welcome and appreciate it if anybody could come to a web page as a book and um, help 
uh, work with me to improve this book, to improve these ideas, to get really rich examples, um, and to thresh, uh, flash out the, um, the thesis, so to speak. Thrash out the thesis. Um, so that's the URL. And yeah, I think maybe we'll go for some questions. Thank you. Questions or discussion points? Nobody. Do, would you like to use the microphone? First of all, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. I've just got one question with the idea of, not a question with the idea of collaborating, collaboratively producing a book, but with the idea of keeping this book alive and changing it for going on and on and on and on. To me, it sounded much like, well, making a book more or less like a wiki. Like, for example, Wikipedia, I could interpret in some way as a collaboratively created encyclopedia which lives on and on and on and on. Oh. What I consider now to be the specifics of a book, uh, for example, in contrast of a wiki, is that it is finished at some point. It doesn't, doesn't, matter, it doesn't mean that you can't relate to it or you can't reuse it in some way but that it takes some kind of a snapshot at a certain point in time which people can refer to. So if I say I read the book by author A and I say, okay, in his book XYZ, the author made this point, then people go look up, look up this book two years later and they see, okay, it changed a lot. He doesn't make this point anymore. So what do you see the difference between this book, a book wiki thing you propose and uh, a real wiki which lives on and on and on and on and changes every day, more or less. Um, we have to address that question. It's, um, okay, so, um, on the top level, um, digital media means that you can look after the provenance of a work, right? It's entirely, impo it's tr entirely possible to have one version of the book, which is the canonical version that a certain sector loves, and uh, another version, or versions, which are just taking it somewhere else. We can have them both side by side. There's no problem there. And, um, and there's, there are some examples of this, right? There's Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. I don't know if everybody knows this. It's Jane Austen work, Pride and Prejudice, and then it was re-released, uh, re Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, as a splatter horror book. Um, but we still have Pride and Prejudice. We have no problem with this. Um, the other, the other um, point is, is that, um, well, maybe I'll leave that one. Yeah, another point. Question, discussion point. I was gonna, I was gonna talk about Wikipedia and how some people believe that Wikipedia can be finished, right? It's, it is a discourse that, uh, it's an authority of knowledge versus collaborative production discourse, which is a very interesting question, but I, I won't go, I don't think that's really for here. Right. Also, thank you very much for your presentation. You. If you want to start a collaborative production of a, of a book uh, with people that never even thought of doing something like that, what would be the starting point to get them involved and would there be a moderator needed for right. the process? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, thank you. Um, I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the roles that we need in this environment and one of the areas that we need experience in is actually in, in, in community managers of collaborative production, right? You need people who, who have experience on how to get people together to work together to create these kind of works. And we kind of, you know, we, um, there just is a lack of this, this kind of skill set. Within the uh, open source free software production circle, um, they often call them um, cat herders, right? You know, the idea uh, is that uh, if you ever tried to get a group of cats to move in one direction, <laughs> it's kind of tricky. And um, that's similar to open source production, right? And there are certain things that you have to know about how to make these people, how to get, facilitate the wheels to get these people working together. And we need to share, develop experiences through trial and error and share these, these experiences to learn how to get the best out of collaborative book production. Um, so my answer would be, um, that you would um, just start. Um, you, you start a book, 
you invite the people that you uh, feel that would be interested in collaborating, and you make a very direct appeal to them. This works the most effectively. Um, you know, if you can look at them in the eye, even better. Um, if you can write them a direct email, and you invite them directly in, say, look, um, I'm thinking about developing a book like this. I think it's very useful, you know, for this. Make it something that they feel that they want to invest in, and try and entice them into it. It's, um, it's not necessarily um, it, the easiest process. You know, sometimes people will give a lot of commitment verbally, but then not actually pitch in. So you just have to keep broadening the circle, making the process as rewarding for them as possible. Um, one of the things that I've found is making it as enjoyable as possible um, so that, you know, they actually feel that they're getting something from this, social engagement or, or just fun or hanging out with people who have a shared interest or whatever. Um, and another side of this, if you can, what works best of all is to get them into a room. This is why book sprints are so effective, is to get them into a room and together produce the book and give yourself a specific finite time to make that book um, produced. If you can't do it in one block, do it in several blocks, like Siavula does, right? They invite people when they have free time to sit down and work together and get so far and come back and go the next step. And just keep moving it forward like that. And man you have to manage the community. You have to see the book as a community. And you aren't there to write the book and get other people to help. You're to, you're to collaborate with them, but also to, to really manage the community process. Yeah. So this is an area we really need to develop a lot of skills and start sharing them, I believe. Does that answer your question? Is that, yep, please. I'd like to elaborate on that last point, and I have a second question. So the first one, at, at least in our culture, writing is thought to be a very individual um, process. That um, uh, we have in our culture the idea that dealing with language it, it is a, a very personal way of expressing yourself. So um, how do you get a certain homogeneity in your collaborative books. Oh, yeah, okay. uh, this is my first yeah. um, question. My second mm -hmm. question is, can you elaborate a little on the economics of writing um, a collaborative book? That is, how much money is needed? Um, how are the authors um, paid, um, etc.? Okay, so the, the first point, the last point first, the economics, you know, if you, if you like the people you work with, you should try and make as much money as possible to pay them as much as possible, right? So um, if you can raise 150000 on Kickstarter, divvy it up, you know, um, and pay them well. Um, that's one end of the scale. The other end of the scale, of course, you know, in, in, in the way that it often works in free software production is that you're trying to work with people who have very little time, you don't have money to pay for them, and, that, and that's a much more difficult exercise. That's the scale. There's no simple way of saying this is the, this is the figure. Um, it also depends on context, commitment. You might just hit that person who's just totally evangelistic about being involved in this project, and they'll just, they'll just go for it. I had, I had um, for example, um, several years ago, had a couple of experiences with retired um, uh, copy editors um, coming along and just going head to toe through a book. These are, these are experienced professionals that, in, that um, liked the book that was being produced, or the books that were being produced. Um, went online, so it didn't ask anybody, and just went top to toe and cleaned up the text. You know, so um, you can have amazing things that happen like this. How much it's going to cost for a specific book? It's very, it's, a, it's the how long is a piece of string question. Um, but if you if you have an idea, I'm very happy to talk to you and give you some sort of tips on how you might be able to do it cost effectively or how you might be able to generate more money for it. Um, on the question of how do you get harmony within a text, well, there's two positions on this, right? The first one is harmony is a good thing, and the second one is actually I don't like. I, I want to have disharmony. I want to have active voices. You know, the collaborative futures was a very good example. It was a book about collaboration, and we had a lot of discussion about you know how you represent yourself in this text if you have an anecdote. There was one guy who used to be in the Israeli army, and he would talk about the word collaboration, or collaborator, was a very negative word. Collaborators were often killed, right? So we were talking about the positive side of collaboration. So when he wanted to put this antithesis into the book, what does he do? Does he quote himself? <laughs> um, you know, does he represent himself in the third person? Or does he just say, I had this experience? And then four, you know, four chapters later, 
there's a woman talking about um, her family as being collaborative. You know, what does she do, quote herself or just speak as in the first person? It's a very interesting discussion and the more that I get closer to it, I think I'm, the more I like to investigate these areas, you know, of, of the narrative position and voice and not necessarily think that harmonizing text is the default good. Um, but at the same time, there are strategies. Um, one of the strategies is that you find if people are working together in close collaboration, it's not just a point that they're writing one chapter by themselves, but they write a little bit of a chapter, and then somebody else writes a little bit of a chapter, and somebody else. And then you have somebody else that goes through that chapter and tries to make it um, sound as one voice. You can do this, right? You have someone come through, pull everything together so it more or less sounds the same or respects the sort of the nuances and tries to make it and have some kind of harmony. And that's a very particular skill, but it is possible to achieve that. Um, and the more that you have people go through the text and, and writing together, if you're after harmony, the more you need people coming afterwards and sort of re-articulating that in a specific voice. So once the content's in place, you know, uh, you can have those people come through and harmonize the text, is how we talk about it. There are some books, that, um, Marriage of Minds, I don't think it's a very good book, but it's a, it's a book about um, collaborative fiction writing between a husband and wife team that have written some um, very popular books, and they talk about this process of passing the text um, backwards and forwards to each other and getting to the point, their aim is, at the end, end of the day, the reader would not be able to identify um, who wrote what in the book, and they see that as a result of intensive collaboration, you know, passing it backwards and combing through it again and again and again. Um, so there, you, you can achieve it, but I would just challenge that position and say it's quite interesting to consider um, multiple voices and perspectives in a text and preserving those. Um, yeah. Any other points, questions? No. Okay, you're free to go to lunch. <laughs> oh, no, we have one. As you were just mentioning, people writing only very short parts of chapters and so on, I was starting to wonder, um, if all this is based so much on reputation, how can you build a reputation when authorships of texts is no longer like attributable? Now, if we're talking now, we're saying maybe there are authors who wrote <laughs> classical books now collaborating on new books and using their reputation to push those new kinds of books. But if you are, if you are an author only working, well, it's, uh, it's fiction right now, but only working in those collaborative settings, how do you build reputation outside the community of the collaborators? They know what you did, but nobody else does. And if there are 10 authors on the book, nobody can see who, who was it and who has, has the best ideas and the good ideas. Yeah. I mean, I think there, is, there, are some sort of, um, there are some sort of points where, um, where recognition is transferred to the person who, or persons that facilitate the production. So instead of the writers, it goes to the facilitator as being the enabler. Their reputation is enhanced and it's better activate, enables them to generate more revenue or whatever to bring the next one together, etc., and opens up media channels and things like this. That's one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is that Attribution and free culture, right, is impossible to maintain. It's impossible. Like, um, there are some books in Floss Manuals where we have um, 40 or 50 people have, have contributed to one chapter over three or four years. So how do you maintain that kind of attribution? So attribution is increasingly, I think, becoming a transient item, right? It can be focused around an event. So we produce this this book or this version of this book or whatever, and that is the attribution of that moment. Five years later, somebody else does something, they, they gain the attribution right themselves to a point. But the technical management of it also is, is just impossible. I mean, like, can you carry all of this content, um, attribution content with the artifact? It's, it's really, I, imagine, this, imagine a book in 300 years time or 50 years time or 20 years time that is a, a result of, an, of multiple forkings, recontextualizations. Attribution has to become more transient. It's just, it's just not sustainable. So we have to let go of these ideas of the, you know, the author, the, the creator, you know, and, um, and look at more interesting models, I think, or, or, or ones that are more appropriate for this context. And it doesn't mean that you lose the right to generate, um, the opportunity to generate revenues, 
Um, if you look at models where uh, service models for production of books, you know, where you, where you generate income to produce a book, which is a service model, um, then you get paid at the begin, beginning anyway, right? So it's kind of like, uh, often the reputation is used for the ongoing sales by publishers. So. Okay, great. Maybe we finish it there. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>